So, uh, Jonathan and I talked about doing this, what, yesterday? Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, this is kind of a last minute thing. It's a set of slides I put together last night. Um, but it's uh, pretty new. The Java 11 release happened on the 25th. It happened in the afternoon. We looked for it in the morning. It wasn't there. Um, so to start, I want to talk a little bit about how support works for it, uh, based on what I read and, of course, what Jonathan said. But um, if you want to use official Oracle builds, they've got a nice, easy pricing scheme, finally. It used to be call Oracle or do lunch or have you know, a Fortune 500 company or something, <laughs> something along those lines. Um, now it's $25 per month per processor for Java SE. So the definition of processor is fairly complicated, as it usually is in Oracle. But, and that's, that's for production use. It gives you premier support. Um, and it gives you support until 2023. So if you're actually using it for business and you actually want to buy Oracle support, you can. And they've published the price. So that's, that's very exciting. Now, you don't have to. Um, there's OpenJDK builds available. And you can use those. All the Linux distros will have them in the package manager before too long. You know, you'll just yum install OpenJDK and you'll have JDK 11 and it's just fine. But if you are in a situation where you need support, it's nice that they have it now. So if you don't want to pay for support, use OpenJDK in case Oracle comes knocking on your door and auditing you. Um, if you are a developer, you can use the Oracle builds for free on your computer. They only care as soon as you use it in production for commercial use. So for education, for hobby, for personal development, for even work development, you're fine to use it. Um, and it's a, it's a good case right now because the Mac OpenJDK 11 build that you can download from Oracle doesn't really work that well. Like it uh, gives you a tarball, it gives you all the files, but it doesn't have the installer, it doesn't integrate into the Mac ecosystem. Uh, but the Oracle download, the official one, does. And if you're just a developer and you're not running production code, your Mac isn't a, you know, a business server, then you're probably just fine to use it. So there's a, a lot of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt around what's going on with these Oracle licenses. But if you're a developer using it on your computer, you're safe. If you're running it on your servers, use OpenJDK. Um, as of yesterday, last night, Adopt OpenJDK didn't have a JDK 11 build on their site, but they've committed to supporting it, so that should be along any time. And if you're in for a fun project, you're really bored, you need something to do on Friday night, you can get the source code and build it. I mean, it's, it's available, it's on Mercurial, so you have to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your first hurdle. Um, but uh, apparently it's getting easier, and I think there's a lot of support from Red Hat that's gone into making OpenJDK buildable by mere mortals. So um, these slides, they go through about um, 10 or 15 new features in JDK 11. And some of them are fairly technical and under the hood changes that um, don't affect the language. And some of them are things that we can look at together. And on some of the slides, I've added um, a little, a little mob task, something we can discuss, something we can try. And I definitely want us all to work together and ask and answer questions. Um, I'm certainly no expert on this. I'm uh, no deeper into the JDK than most people are. But I've just been reading it and following releases and finding it interesting. So uh, the first one is JAP181, uh, which improves nested classes in Java from sort of a, a compiler and runtime point of view. It doesn't make any changes at all to the language. You probably won't even notice, other than if you use a lot of nested classes, your class files might get a bit smaller. Um, for languages other than Java, there may be advantages as well that I'm not too sure about. But the main thing is, is um, it gets rid of extra boilerplate code the compiler had to put in to access private methods in your inner classes. Um, 
slides you see the methods that the compiler inserted. Not your own. <laughs> help nested classes access private networks and take down secret sources. So the second one um, is another technical low-level one that I'm not even too sure about the impact of. Um, it's another, another class file and compiler improvement that allows dynamic constants that can be run, set up at startup time. Um, and I have a feeling this is for other, other dynamic languages more than Java. Um, and it makes absolutely no changes to the Java language and you won't even notice it um, unless you're a fairly deep Java language developer. So, does anybody, does anybody know anything more about this? Anybody have some hints or insights about advantages, why they would have done this? That's top it. secret. <laughs> I mean, the, even the, um, the information was fairly opaque. <laughs> yeah, I don't know which language it was. It was intended to support. Jonathan's furiously Googling. <laughs> I don't think they say there. Yeah, it's a um, new dynamic language feature anyway. If you find it, wave your arms. All right, um, another compiler change, more under the hood stuff that's new in Java 11, is um, new intrinsics for the uh, ARM platform. So if you're compiling Java to ARM, the ARM runtime now has native functions for um, sine, cosine, and log. Uh, which will be a major performance improvement. Before that would have to be run in uh, bytecode, and now it can be run in native code. And bringing that uh, bytecode into native code by the, by the VM is much, much faster because it has boilerplate to do it. So again, no changes in the language. Uh, if you are running Java in ARM, that's a big improvement for you. Um, this one, as again, no language changes, but it's um, a fun and interesting thing they've done, this Epsilon garbage collector, um, which is an experiment uh, in making a garbage collector that doesn't collect garbage. It's not something you'd ever really want to use in, in real life development, but it's, um, it's something for testing. Um, if you want to performance benchmark code and not have the garbage collector interfere with your benchmarks in any way, it's good for that. Um, if you want to test how much memory your process allocates without it ever being collected and seeing how long you can run before you run out of memory or to make sure that objects are being reused properly, you can, do, you can use it for that in a testing, testing method. Um, if you're running command line programs or programs that will never exhaust their memory and just need to start up, do something, and exit, uh, possibly container type stuff as well. You can use it and get a little bit more performance. Um, they say it's, if you've fixed every other possible latency issue in your code and you want it to go just that little bit faster, you can use it for that or you can use it to get just a little bit more throughput once you've optimized everything else out of your, uh, out of your code. So it's a really specialist garbage collector. Um, it's easy to turn on and use, but um, not, not really something you'd use in uh, daily application development. So we can, uh, we can try to write a little bit of code together that makes Epsilon GC run into memory if you want, or we can, anybody interested in, see, I, I didn't try this beforehand. <laughs> Oh, okay. So it looks like <coughs> compilers use constant table entries in class files as 
scratch space for things that can duplicate you know, large array initialization. Um, one thing that's mentioned a few times in here is um, you can run as a compiler pick, you can say int dot class or long dot class to the input like the primitive type name dot class and you get the class constant for the primitive type. Um, apparently there's an elaborate workaround in the Java compiler to make that possible because there's no the constant pool entries have a type in the class file specification, and there's no type that is appropriate to support that. So essentially, adding new types of constants is really hard and breaks a lot of stuff. So they're saying if we, if we add one more new type of constant, which is dynamic, we never have to add one again. And so compilers will be able to do much simpler things by giving dynamic constants. Okay. Tricks that the compiler does, they'll be able to do a lot more tricks. So for enhanced language support, better, yeah. better, faster compilation. That's the idea there. Success on here is that that construct like int dot class or long dot class will be way simpler in Java C. And then they had a list of things that I didn't click on where there were a bunch of other features that were simpler than that. All right, so let's test this Epsilon garbage collector. I've turned it on. I think that will turn it on. I've got a very, very simple Spring Boot application here. Um, let's see if this still runs. An unlock. Ah. Look at that with a very good error message. Thank you, Java. Let's add that as well. And run. OK, so we got a bit of code here. How shall we make it run out of memory? Just this logger? And that'll probably spend a week writing to the console. <laughs> My graphics card may slow this down too much. So what can we do instead that would make an object and maybe throw it away? It's really hard to get it to do that because the compiler makes it a good at finding things that don't use. Yes. Maybe you could redirect the output of the program to get it out. Well, we could make a new, like, uh, Mm. Make a bunch of big integers. <laughs> Byte array val. Uh, and let's make this declare this outside our loop, maybe. I think we can do this now. Yeah. This is uh, Java 9? 7. Seven. Well, let's go for a billion. <laughs> so what's wrong with my cow? Initial value. Ah, uh, yes, I'll just do that. There we go. So, let's run this and see what happens. Have a show of hands, will this finish? I think it will. Yeah. Should take a drink. Hey! <laughs> it worked. 
So anyway, that's an example of the Epsilon garbage collector. <laughs> so now take away the Epsilon garbage collector and see if it finishes. See if it finishes. All right, edit run configuration. No more Epsilon garbage collector. And run. This could take a while, although I've got many cores. Well, it's not parallel. Actually, I may have one. <laughs> uh, let's see. JetBrains command line launcher. Is this which is my actual application? There it is. This comes up later in our presentation. You can see it's doing garbage collection right now with the heap going up and down. <laughs> I don't know how long a billion will take. There's no point waiting, really. We can, just, we can see that it's actually collecting garbage. Let's see if we can make that bigger. So you'll find out what this is later. Stop this. And all right, let's move on to the next one. There's about, I think, 10 or 15 of these. So um, not all of them will do full demos. <laughs> so this one is just removal of some stuff from Java. Um, and most of it you may not care about. And some of it will bite you when you try to build code that worked in Java 8. Um, Nobody is probably going to mind Corba disappearing. Um, <laughs> For their sake. <laughs> but a lot of projects depend on Java.activation and um, Jaxby and things that just worked, especially if you were using a, um, a Java EE system. Um, so in the case of this, when your build breaks, you're going to have to find dependencies that you can add to your build um, for, to replace the stuff that was removed from the, the Java system by default. Um, most of them are available, and Oracle has done a pretty good job documenting the availability. Uh, I've, I've added a couple of things to my to the speaker notes on this one. I didn't make a slide for it. But there's a bunch of Maven artifacts that are available for a lot of this stuff that you can just add to your, add to your POM and it will solve this build problem. Uh, most of this was deprecated as of Java 9. Um, so you may have started to see problems then. Hopefully you fixed your builds, but they're gone forever at this point. So uh, the next JEP. The next new feature in Java 11 is a very upgraded HTTP client. And this has been a process that's come through JDK 9, through JDK 10, um, and finally in JDK 11. Um, it's got support for HTTP 2. It's finalized now. It's a standard. There's the JavaNet HTTP official package for it. Um, it supports things like asynchronous communication. It completely re replaces the old um, but java.net.url, I think was the old way that you would do this within the Java API. Yeah. So this is, um, this is a modern way to do it. Uh, it may replace things if you have external dependencies like um, Apache HTTP common, the HTTP components and OKHTTP OK from Square. This can provide most of the features that those third-party libraries were using before completely built into the language. So um, I don't, again, this is one that I've never made an example for and I've never used this API. But uh, do we have anybody else in the room who has? Use the java.net.http. All right, let's give it a try. We will just replace this little bit of code here with something that maybe gets a web page. So why don't we pull up the Java doc for it? 
uh, java.net.http. I think this is it. No, is it? No, that's the new one. Is it? Okay, java.net. Oh, yes. No, okay. So we want the. Um, let's start, but let's go to 11. Let's see if that works. Oh, no. This is. Uh, Good exploration. OK. Java.net.http. Look at us. Oh, look at this module graph. That's fancy. <laughs> so if you're into, into the module thing. OK. So it looks like HTTP client, HTTP request. A builder of HTTP clients. Builders are created by creating. All right. Well, let's uh, let's try to make one of these. New builder. Yep. Uh, all right, and let's make a variable. And I, we probably need an HTTP request, right? Let's see what that looks like. New builder URI. OK. All right, I need a URI. Google.com. Something with HTTPS. Google? Yeah. Build? Good variable naming. <laughs> Now, I bet you the client can run the request, right? Oh, it needs to be a, a URI URI? Ooh. <laughs> That's why you paid the 100 bucks. <laughs> yeah. And the touch bar on this thing. Uh, OK, so how do we make this request actually happen? Uh, ooh, send. OK, request. And we need a response body handler. Lambda. So we can do, I don't know. All right. Oh, yeah, there we go. OK. And then we get rid of that, and we get rid of this. Now, I don't know what we put in here. I think I just, uh, a response info. So, that gets a semicolon. Oh, I have to, yeah, do I have to return something?
tense object. You get F1 on Let's see. No. This is missing return statement. Return null. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see what let's see what happened. Let's see if we can make a null pointer exception. Woo. Okay. Something happened. A lot. <laughs> I exception null. Oh no. Uh, I don't think I got a logged in info. Oh, yes. It has a, doesn't have a two string. Uh, there's no two string. You're supposed to be returning something called a body subscriber. Oh. This is, compl this is complicated. <laughs> How about we just get the uh, logs? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, you have so example code in that. HTTP response dot body handlers with an S. Has oh, HTTP response dot body handlers. Handlers. Okay. I do have to make a. Yeah, no, that, that's the body handler. The body subscriber is what you're describing. Body so subscriber. This, this whole lambda, that's the body handler. Body subscriber is not this. No stack trace? Yep. So there's an of string instead of uh, instead of discard returning to a body handler string that returns a body subscriber string. The of a string or returns a string of string. No, apparently there's the there's the if you leave it up here, there's a default string. <coughs> And does this send return something? That's a uh, local variable. <laughs> we get a response. Yeah. Ooh, hey, that would be neat, wouldn't it? <laughs> Okay. Uh, redirect policy. <laughs> redirect uh, normal. Let's try normal. The other one sounds like it's dangerous. <laughs> hey, look at that. And I got a get. So from this response, maybe I can get the um, body. And totally spam my log window. Hey, there's Google. There we go. So we learned a new API ish. <laughs> That's fun. Okay. Back to our slides. Uh, we'd probably have to find a server that has. How do, I wonder how we would know. X dot status code. Yeah, we might need deeper logging turned on. Version? Let's try that. And we'll say version.
scroll through google.com. Hey. HTTP, so we've used HTTP2. There you go. Look at us. Ah, <laughs> uh, it probably won't even, I don't even think it supports HTTP, look, we're using HTTPS as well. All right, there's cal.org, one, HTTP 1.1 one, one, status code 200. Okay, well that works. Um, I think there's an, a, there's an asynchronous method as well that returns a future. Send, send async, and I'll just chop this off and let IntelliJ fill this in for us. She <laughs> was dot get. Is that a feature to take the uh, No, no. Um, the, the standard community one will do that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It shows people uh, a little post of the <laughs> shortcuts they detected. Oh, that's a good idea. Sure. Uh, presenter. Uh, Soljay preferences. Pre uh, plugins. Presenter. Browse repositories. Okay, yeah, install. Except that shrink wrap. <laughs> There's another one that says, does this actually mean another one that will bang you every time you jump into the shortcut? <laughs> and if you do, and if you do an action, uh, I forget the name of this, but if you do an action more than three times, it doesn't have a shortcut. <laughs> It'll say you've used this action more than three times. Did you want to create a shortcut? Nice. Oh, that's good. I like that. Yeah. But there are some things I use that I wish had a shortcut. Yeah, I forget the name. The one that just nags you to use shortcuts. It's great. I like that. Close the All right, let's see if this. Uh... There it is. There it is. Ooh. That's kind of cool. So if I use. Yeah, anyway. Okay, let's go back to our slides. So that's the new HTTP client, um, which did exist before but is now formalized. Um, this is a very simple one to demonstrate, the local variable syntax for Lambda parameters. So Lambda, Lambdas have always supported type inference, um, but they made a minor change to Java so you can use the var keyword if you want. And the big side effect of that is that you can use annotations in the Lambda now. Uh, which you couldn't do before. So we can demonstrate that in like seconds. Oh, yeah, there's my J shell. Oh, where's my IDE? So let's get rid of this. And you can say like. <laughs> you can do a list. Ah, this is a new one, right? List.of. Oh, yeah, and then it, you can just like do a. Yeah. So that's exciting, right? So we can get one of these and introduce local variable. And so we can say integers dot stream dot, I don't know, what's fun here? Sum. Sum. No, we want, we want uh, lambda. And we can say var x. No, yeah? This has to be in parentheses. And this brace doesn't go here. Number 
this is in Monday or Friday Monday? I think if you don't have the semicolon at the end, it's an expression. It no. gives it for you? What's the expression? Oh, it wants a semicolon here. And I need a semicolon here and no semicolon here, I think. Good enough. You wouldn't need a var at this point. It compiles without it. But if you want to do an annotation like at not null or at nullable or something, then you can use it with the var keyword. And you can put an annotation there. You couldn't do that before. Without var, it's an error. <laughs> so this should print. Oh, did it? Did it just? Uh, did it just eat my? Um... There. Now it has to do something. It can't just optimize it out. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, there. That's that's the um, var keyword in lambdas. So minor feature. What am I doing? I want. You know. All right, these ones, um, they've added a few new crypto features to Java, mostly to support TLS 1.3, which comes up later. Um, so if you are into elliptic curve or into TLS 1.3, this might be an excitement for you, but. Uh, <laughs> Did you use some elliptic curve? <laughs> I used the library today that uh, was for creating and encoding and verifying JSON web tokens. And it specifically said you can use these standardized with any two algorithms if you have JDK 11 or US. Hey! What is this bouncy castle? Yeah, this, this avoids you using the bouncy castle library. It's built in now. Yeah. Just by its place. It's often there because you depend on something else. Exactly, it's something else. Yeah. yeah. But it's built in now. It reflects it for exactly. Unicode 10 uh, gives more character information, uh, more character types, very minor language changes, um, just some new uh, constants, I think, mostly. Um, an interesting thing about this is that um, Java does not implement the Unicode collations, um, at least for certain, certain major groups of Unicode characters. So if you need to do advanced sorting or comparison on Unicode strings, you may not get what you expect. Is taco greater than or less than taco? Well, that's why you need the collation. Taco is greater than everything. <laughs> yeah. Taco sorts to the, to yeah. the end of everything. Is, is the oh, Swedish A with the circle on top yeah. greater or less than? You know, the one without the... So, can we do some <laughs> so it's, uh, if you need to sort things, if you need to order things, you may not get expected behavior. I think it's got, I think it's got basic collations, but the, the deepest ones in Unicode aren't there yet. Um, okay, this is a fairly interesting one. This came out of uh, Oracle's professional Java suite, and they've recently open sourced it. Uh, you used to have to pay big bucks to get this. But it is um, essentially a high-speed logging library that interferes as little as possible with your code and works at a very low level in the JVM, JVM writes binary files, um, and is accessible from Java Mission Control, which is uh, this thing that I showed you earlier. So this can open information that you've created with Flight Recorder. Uh, Flight Recorder gives you annotations and log methods and also provides a lot of extra instrumentation in your application 
and then you can open the logs in this and see exactly what happened. So you can see here there's uh, loading. Does this actually have flight recorder stuff? I have never implemented any, any thing using flight recorder and I'm not going to do it today. It's something that could definitely use its own TJUG talk. <laughs> it's instrumenting your code with flight recorder. Uh, but even, even without it, the, um, the mission control application is available from the OpenJDK site. And as you saw today, it's useful. Very easy to get into. Yeah, the JVM just like turns them off, so they don't even, as opposed to just changing the log level in your logging framework, this like just, they don't do anything. So anybody into advanced JVM performance or logging, this would be a great talk. It would be cool to see an integration between flight control and like data talk or something where you could send all of your flight control parameters to something that's fancy like mission control. Um, has anybody used this? Yep. Excellent. Yeah, it's nice that they've made this free. That probably also means they've stopped supporting it officially. <laughs> and it's now like... That's right. Yeah, there was a big uh, thing about that. They're like, it's free it. and it's dead. No. But hopefully the community will work on this. I'm going to blast through a couple of these. Um, this is another, this is a stream cipher that they've added, again, for TLS 1.3 compatibility and probably also the um, JWT and other things that use modern cryptographic. This replaces RC4, which is proven to be no good anymore. So if you're using RC4, use this instead. Um, this is a neat little thing. You can do, uh, you can run single, Java files now. Uh, we were talking about Java. You know, I heard you talking about Java C earlier. Um, this you can just do with a single, single Java file. Run it with the Java command, and off it goes. So for how many people? Uh, I'm a ten now. Was that the first thing you tried when you were learning Java? Did you try to run a Java file? It didn't work. It works now. Where's my console? Okay, let me get out of J shell. I'm looking for the manual. Uh, so, we need a class. Oh, yes, to run. Public class hello. Public static void main string. And we need the arguments. And let's do a system out dot. <laughs> And we need to close our method. We need to close our class. To control D. And do you think this will work? <laughs> Whoa. Hey, look at that. <laughs> See, who needs the IDE? <laughs> just, just, just develop it with cat. <laughs> VIs just bloat. I mean, you don't want to go, go all the way there. Yeah, do the shebang now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh-uh. -uh. Oh, I don't need the... I, I have to do something else first. I need to know where... Whoa, that's very loud. Oh, that's kind of where we'd expect, right? 
You never know with the, the Mac thing. Okay. No, don't. That's just Nano being friendly. And. It doesn't? Oh. oh. A lower class age. Ooh, ah, I'm. Uh, this presentation account doesn't have my caps lock key remapped to control like my real account does. <laughs> That's um. Okay, MV. Hello. To. Hello. Is this gonna work? Why? There's a uh, something you have to put. Maybe. Jonathan, quickly Google. Maybe you need a dash or something. Or maybe it doesn't work in Macintosh. Oh. Dash dash source. Like that? Uh, yeah. Hey! Oh, yeah. So we've made a <laughs> we've made a Java powered shell script. That's <laughs> that's not something you've been able to do before. Oh yeah, yeah. We could use the um, we could use the epsilon garbage collector oh, yeah. to make it even faster. Yeah, I I don't remember the. I'd have to go back and look it up. All right. Anyway, I think we're. Normally we would have been kicked out by now. So I don't know. It's, we're on slide fifteen of twenty one. Okay, single file. Uh, Oh, okay, sneaky. And so the reason they leave the first new line is so when the compiler tells you errors, the line number goes off. <laughs> so the JLS hasn't changed. Hash bang is not a common character, but it's the same language as hash bang. Um, it's just uh, the, the launcher takes it out of the passage. You have to put it in source 11 there to make that happen? I guess so. I think that the, the detection of what launch mode the Java launcher Uh, I don't think you could in that case. You can put multiple top level public classes in, in one file. In that file. It allows that. But um, you can't add more dependencies. So it's restricted to what's in the public. Wait, couldn't you put a shebang inside of a jar file to execute? Mm, no. You can put. No, because it'll pass whatever is. It's a neat hack. Yeah, you could have a class path that has all the public classes in it. Yeah, you could have a class path that has all the public classes in it. Yep. Um, the 
It's also they specified how it interacts with the module system, which is that the thing, the, the classes they get compiled go into the default module, and um, they are not visible to some other modules. So you can't you can't have your shebang file to find types that are visible to some modules. That makes sense. Well, you shouldn't do that. But no, that yeah. Would be <laughs> All right, let's uh, blast through a couple more of these. Um, there's new heap profiling, uh, which is a thing that we all have to do to our Java apps one day or another uh, when they're running out of memory and we need to figure out what's going on. So they've got a faster way to do that. Um, I think it's integrated with the uh, mission control and probably new open source tooling uh, is coming to go with it, but it uses the standard JVM tooling interface and it's much faster than the classic heap profiler where it has to like dump the heap and analyze it as far as I know. Um, so those two crypto things before enabled this, TLS 1.3. Um, and according to Oracle, it's a minimal TLS 1.3. It doesn't contain the full feature set, but their goal is for it to be compatible with websites and doing internet stuff. And they haven't gone for all the weird edge conditions yet. Uh, again, no, no changes to the Java language. It will just start working for you, um, other than the new algorithm names, so just some new constants. There is another new garbage collector, which is the Z garbage collector, or the Z garbage collector if you're American. Um, and that's not something I'm going to demonstrate here, but it's a low latency garbage collector. So it's for um, maybe like high speed trading or games. Um, UI stuff, which nobody ever does in Java anymore, like GUIs. Um, but it costs, it costs overall throughput to achieve the low latency. So it's less optimal for actually getting work done, but it means there's no pauses. So they've, they've set a minimum or a maximum G allowable GC pause at like five or 10 milliseconds or something very short like that. Um, so again, it, it's something that you can experiment with if you need low latency in your applications, which is it's a bit of a special case. So is that something that anybody does here, low latency, like high speed trading, or? If you have something with an absolutely gigantic heap, like say, say your heap is. Um, terabytes? <laughs> yeah, say, say it's a two terabyte heap, and you got a web service, well, so like, in my line of work, say, say you have a web service that's got like, thousand people's um, genome shards in memory. And you want to return whether or not a particular variant exists for a certain person. And it's all in memory. And there is some garbage that's happening. Um, the cost of a full PC there to go through all of that data. That would be seconds. It would be like a lot of many seconds. And you, your app would freeze and it would probably fail its health check and get rebooted by your a lot to start up again because you have to get all those terabytes back into memory. Yeah. Um, so this one, if, if your pause time only depends on the size of the, of the number of PC groups rather than the amount of memory that is allocated, that could be useful. Yep. I, I still wouldn't design a system that keeps terabytes of memory around. <laughs> well, you never know. I've done that, apparently. Yep. All right. Um, this is uh, one that affects, it's going to affect me uh, at work, but uh, I don't know how common this is used, but they're removing the, uh, the Nastron JavaScript engine from Java. So that lets you run JavaScript inside your Java applications and communicate with them, pass things in and out to them. And it's really, really handy if you need to script things within an application. Uh, um, it's going to be no longer maintained. It's open source. It's part of JDK, right? But it's. Um, this one's actually sadder than the, yeah, the removal of Corva. And, um, <laughs> it is because it's actually useful. I'm using it right now. Yeah. I am I, too. I, I use it all the time. Yeah. Um, it, it's sad because the reason that they're deprecating it is because people don't use it. Because it's, it's too hard. <laughs> And so they've actually, there was a note in the get that says if credible maintainers volunteer 
to keep this up to date with ECMAScript, that they will undo the deprecation. Mm -hmm. Which is an unusual thing for them to do. Growl GS? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yes, that's right. They've got their own pluggable, um, pluggable thing. So there are third party JavaScript uh, script implementations available. So that may be an alternative. Yeah. Well, this one, if you don't care about the latest JavaScript no. language revision, you could include the jar of Nasorn. Yeah. Even right now, I think it's ECMAScript 6. Okay. So it's, it's, it's far behind the, the current release even today. So they were like, we can't really bring this up to date, so we're just going to throw it out. Um, the similar but um, less annoying kind of thing, because nobody probably ever used PAC 200 or know, knew they used it, uh, they're getting rid of that, which was their Oracle's version of zip. Sun's version of zip to make smaller jar files uh, to make your applets load faster on your 56k modem. <laughs> um, so they decided the complexity of this and just having yet another unique compressor and just maintaining it was a pain. So they're just going to kill it. Nobody ever used it. Really complicated. Yeah, we did. It has. It has the. Well, you had a huge applet, right? So we actually had somebody in the room who used it. That's yeah, we did. amazing. All right. So this is the last slide I've got. Um, and just a query to the room. What do you all think of the future of Java? How do you think it's going? What do you think of the new high-speed release cadence from Oracle? Do you think that's improving Java? Do you think it's making it worse? Do you think it's making it harder to keep up? What do you think? You don't want to start. <laughs> yes, yeah. I guess there's a lot of people still running Java 6. <laughs> Right. The thing is, is like there aren't. That was pretty much the only thing that was as let's say conservative as it was. Like I can't think of another clock that was. Uh, fair. Enough. But it also ties into a little bit into a lot of Agreed. more traditional views. Right? But I'm saying that that's what that's what my boss will say. Fair. Enough. My boss isn't very technical, so he can give us a yeah. sense of radius in that sense. But yeah, like I, I don't know. It's it's interesting because. On the one side, they're competing with .NET. On the other side, they're competing with all the other KVM languages. Yeah. Very, you know. I, I understand why they're doing it. It's just it's kind of hard. It, it's it's how how do you juggle that uh, in a in a real enterprise environment? So when you have potentially 250 sources and everyone in the team is running different workloads, that is sensitive in different ways to change the things you're doing. Yeah, it's a major change. So, so that's, that's might stabilize uh, enough that it becomes a baseline. Yeah. 
Well, that's what I mean. Like, I, I think the LTS is, is a good idea. I don't know if two years is long enough. Like well, it's, it's supported for longer. I think it's, uh, if you're willing to pay for it. If you're willing to pay for it. Yeah, or... 2023 is the official premier support. Well, so this, uh, if, if you're a Red Hat customer, you get LTS from Red Hat as well. Sure. If you pay for Rel, you get Java Atlanta for a long, long time without paying anything. It's just that right now there's a lot of code that doesn't run on Rel. So it's going to take a while before we get to the point where we say, okay, we're here for willing to pay Java 11. Yeah. Because all, all our you know, code base has been certified in Java 11. And by that time, it's Will Red Hat's Java LTS packages make it into CentOS? Yeah. Yeah. The packages, yes, yeah, but the support. The support won't, of course, yeah. Yeah, but if you're, if you're on CentOS, you'll be able to get Java 11 patches probably until December 30th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, like on the other end of the spectrum, you know, startup, I mean, like, it's still, like, Java still lags essentially behind the open they're in sort of a, a rough spot because now they're not they're not stable enough for a really large enterprise, and they're still not fast enough moving. For, yeah, they need for to start to a continuous update model that's kind of like the norm now for our customers. There is growing pains there, yeah. and they're behind. But on the other hand, a lot of the other tools, if you're looking at the alternative languages, have a lot of built-in issues with Java Seven. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying that. They're, they're, so I'm it's kind of like. It's a like difficult trade-off. They, they used to be. It used to be that they were the enterprise choice because they were as stable as they were. Mm -hmm. They're losing that in order to try to essentially compete with yeah. the other guys. And are they going to be able to get back to it? I don't know. Like that's so, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I, I, I have a question for the room. Who remembers Intel? I think. <laughs> what was the problem? Why? Why? It wasn't. Why did only four people put up their hands? Wasn't backwards compatible. Yeah. And what what had Intel done that Motorola hadn't done? Well, until then, maintained <laughs> backwards compatibility. Yeah. yeah. Intel had backwards compatibility of binary code, which is a Intel 4004 processor that was in a calculator from 1976. Yeah. And then they're suddenly like, "Hey guys, this whole instruction set is bullshit, and Itadium is much better." And so everybody's used. <laughs> I don't care. I just want my 64 bit. And then Intel okay, adopted that. It's much better, but how much better, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the how much compared to the hands. Well, yeah. The, yeah. And so, so to I make that kind of move, you need, you're, you're going to need at a minimum of 10 times improvement over your previous. It's going to have mm -hmm. to be unsubstitute or very significant. Yeah. yeah. And then to this day, AMD default takes a fast like the architecture in Linux binary to call AMD. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's the reason why it's called that. Because yeah. Itanium came out and nobody used it. Yeah. I think I think we're also going to see um, with this Java eleven being an LTS release, is tooling really start to catch up? I mean I know that I know that Maven had growing pains, Spring Boot had growing pains, you know, a lot of the tooling we come to come to rely on kind of broke in Java nine and is just starting to get Fixed. Like you just saw, it was running Spring Boot with no warnings, no errors. It was perfectly fine in Java 11. That's brand new, and that's yeah. still not final release. Yeah, that is brand new. That's exactly. It's not. It's not even released. But this is coming, right? This is something that we're going to get with this Java 11. Now that they have an LTS release, is tooling will catch up, libraries will catch up, libraries will get modularized. Yeah, I think. The big thing was this module is breaking everything, and I think that's yeah, that's yeah. over, that's done, and uh, like a lot of the talks from from Gats and Reinhold and stuff were like, we've got to do this. It's going to be painful. It's going to suck. We've worked on it for so many years, um, it but it's the it. <laughs> was it worth it? I don't know. Is anyone using modules? <laughs> well, they are. No, they're they're using, using it internally. Yeah, that's sure, the, that's why they needed it. It was more of an internal change.
The other thing to consider too is the growing rise of uh, programming languages that, that run on top of the JVM, Scala, yep. Closure, Kotlin. So a lot of this stuff is, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually, the, the, JVM, JVM, the JVM improvements can yeah. matter quite a bit, but I think yeah. we're talking for example. What, what matters less are the grand and the language improvements and practice sugar that they have. That's less of interest to somebody who throws their book in 90% of the time. Yeah. Um, but the JVM improvements, those are important. Because <laughs> those affect the way that Kotlin and Scout and Scout and get implemented. It's nice. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like sure sure an Android. Yeah. It has its own set of tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but the use of the standard is different. All right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so thanks everybody for participating in this, and I hope you had fun. Hope you learned something new with Java 11. Uh, Going to wrap it up, and I think we're supposed to head over there. Uh, are we supposed to settle up first or after? I wasn't you told, say? but. Yeah, I would say settle up if you're leaving. Otherwise, uh, we'll we'll know. We'll just head over to the to the next room, and thank you all very much. Yeah.